Welcome to the Upland Nation podcast, special edition. I hope you're doing well and weathering the storm of COVID-19 restrictions. Still can play with your dog, and we're grateful for that, aren't we? Yes, we are, and I'm looking downrange, and I hope you are as well. We will be hunting this fall, come hell or high water, especially if all the positive vibes are directed toward that. So keep that work going, everybody. I'm Scott Linden. Welcome to the show. Uh, We're outfitted by Cabela's. I'm sitting here in the Cabela's podcast studio. We're doing a special edition on some breaking news that may soon be a part of many other conservation group strategies, as well as the Rough Grouse Society and the American Woodcock Society, which we're going to talk about today. So stay tuned for that. If you're a member, of course, it's very near and dear to your heart. If you're not a member, but you're a bird hunter, or a member of any of those other conservation groups, well, I think this will be relevant to you as well. Before we bring Ben Jones, the CEO of the RGS AWS, onto the line, let me just give you a little bit of background. Back in 61, 1961, I guess I got to start saying that, the Rough Grouse Society was formed. It currently stands at about 20,000 members with about 130 chapters in the U.S. and Canada. Their budget, $3 million. Kind of small change compared to some of the other organizations, but in a lot of ways, a microcosm for what may be happening in the future. The reason, fundraising. Fewer hunters mean fewer members mean fewer dollars. And that's true in every way, shape, or form for virtually everybody else in the conservation world. So um, think about that when you're listening to Ben and what he has to say. Ben comes to us from uh, Coraopolis, Pennsylvania, where the RGS and the AWS are headquartered. He formerly worked with the Forest Service, uh, sometimes on rough grouse biology and habitat, moved over to the Pennsylvania Game Commission as their public lands section chief, and in 2010 became the agency's habitat division chief. A couple years ago, he was enticed to leave any other positions in favor of the Rough Grouse Society and the American Woodcock Society. The restructuring that was recently announced has left a lot of people with a lot of questions, and that's the goal of today's special edition of the Upland Nation podcast. So in a moment or two, we'll get right to it. But first, thank you again to Sage and Breaker. Sageandbreaker.com is where you learn more about the highest caliber gun care and gun cleaning products. And Dogtra.com. Learn all about the TNB dual collar there, my training collar of choice. And these are the folks, among others, who make this special edition possible. So, Dr. Ben Jones, and I think I, I got that right, um, welcome to the program. And uh, how are you doing these days? I'm well, Scott. It's uh, good to be on with you for sure. And, um, you know, I say I'm well, but I think all of us are, um, you know, we're doing well, but certainly coping with uh, something that the likes of which most of us have never seen before, certainly. Well, you know, as they say, if it ra- when it rains, it pours. And uh, yeah, at the Rough Grouse Society and the American Woodcock Society, I'd say that's probably doubly true. Um, why don't you just jump right in and, and explain to us what happened in the last few days, or at least we learned about it in the last few days? Uh, yeah, sure. Well, About three weeks ago, it was March 10th, it was actually the day after my birthday, it became apparent to me that we were going to hit a new level with uh, COVID-19 and where things were going. I was paying attention to um, a lot of the word that was coming out. And so on March 11th, got all of our staff together and um, briefed them that this was going to be a big hit for us. And uh, reason being, Scott, uh, one of the reasons being uh, March through mid-May is our peak fundraising season from local events. So when we looked at that right out of the gate, of course, this wasn't something that us or, or anyone had planned for. We were staring in the face of about a $452,000 shortfall, boom, just like that with no pre-planning. So we started... 
our um, kind of emergency plan into motion and I let staff know we were going to really take a hit from this thing and that uh, all options needed to be on the table from hourly cuts to salaries to potential layoffs and certainly to completely halt all spending because, you know, it was coming and we were going to get hit. Uh, so over that time, then we, of course, you know, understanding that as president and CEO, um, I have a major financial responsibility that even in a crisis like this to make sure we're pulling the, the organization through. And I set another goal for us that we want to make sure we come out of this in better shape than we entered. So there, as difficult as all this is, there also could be opportunities. We're going to have to uh, strip a lot of things down to make it through this. So in that, we may find opportunities to rebuild. And for um, some time, about 18 months, actually, I was brought into the Rough Grouse Society um, where the board and I met on that was um, we wanted to see the Rough Grouse Society have a greater impact. So I was brought in to look at business models and figure out how to grow the organization and increase our mission impact. So we've been working on uh, ways to do that that we've been communicating since then and certainly over the past few days. And um, we were looking at uh, some, some real shortages. So we had to make layoffs earlier this week and uh, we laid off three of our biologist positions, which, you know, through all of this and through all the things they do day in and day out, that bar none is the hardest thing to do because it involves people. And it wasn't something that we took lightly, but um, we had been working on a restructuring, changing our business models prior to this crisis. And like so many other people, this, this crisis kind of forced our hand. Um, and so we did those layoffs and notifications on Monday, which is very hard for us to do. Oh, I, I can only imagine, and uh, not just for you, but for those biologists, are you doing anything to take care of them in the, you know, in the interim based on the current uh, economic situation and uh, uh, the whole coronavirus co crisis? That was first and foremost in, in my mind, of course, and um, to make sure that the people are going to be able to transition through this period and keep their feet under them and uh, stay on health insurance for as long as we could if they had opted to. So definitely uh, I was very comfortable with the package that even under the financial condition conditions that we're in that uh, we were able to help them with. That's yeah. uh, that's great, and I'm sure they're appreciative as well. But uh, the bottom line on all of this is, the, the in effect, the business model for the RGS and the AWS is changing dramatically. Uh, you, you've internally and externally called it a restructuring. But um, uh, with the biologists gone, you're bringing on, in effect, a, a different type of staff person in that regard, and we'll get to that in a minute. But one of your board members described this. Uh, he said, Every now and then you need a fire to change the tra trajectory of a of an organization. Is this is this your fire? Well, like I said, for me, I was brought in as CEO of the Rough Gal Society to change the organization. So this for me is something I've been very diligent about. <laughs> the board is expecting uh, these changes from me. So in terms of this being the fire, you know, this, as I said, really forced our, our hand in, uh, in a way that um, may not have otherwise happened. So we were in crisis mode and we had to do what we had to do. So, and, and so beyond, uh, beyond letting go of the, the biologists on your staff, um, mm -hmm. did you, uh, what is the, you know, if you can distill it down to its essence, what, what is the new direction for the RGS? Um, first of all, I'll, I'll turn around something I was I was really thinking about through this whole thing was to make sure that our men members understood that we weren't just simply abandoning mission which we have a core conservation mission and that by laying off the biologists we weren't abandoning that mission and that we were going to begin uh, recruiting a different kind of position now with that said under the 
financial crisis, uh, I'm certain it'll be a couple months before we can bring new folks on board as we uh, continue to strip down and try to weather this. So what, when you do, what, what are they going to be? The, the name we're giving to the position is Forest uh, Conservation Directors. And what we're doing in many ways is broadening the umbrella and the scope of these, the individuals we're bringing in. So our biologists, I mean, as biologists are very focused on the species, on the biology aspects and our past model, we would raise local funds through our chapters, what we call the drummer funds, which is a fantastic program. Um, those funds would be applied to projects through the direction of the regional biologist until the point where all the funds were used up get to a balance of zero, and then you kind of start over again fundraising. And um, we need to build that model out to something that's more sustainable. So what I've been thinking about, not just during my last two years at RGS, but during my entire career in forest wildlife conservation is when we are doing forest management to create habitat, that also makes available a commodity product that can be revenue. Now let's take a comparison with agricultural land where we use things like the farm bill to pay producers to take a commodity product off the market and we use tax dollars to, to underwrite that. With rough grouse and forest management work, our doing the work creates a commodity product and puts it on the market. And we need to find ways to incorporate that sustainably into our business model. And when you look at this concept that's out there now, the catchphrase is working for us, where landowners, other organizations are using that funding from revenue generated from forest products to self-fund their programs and to increase the amount of conservation work that they're able to do. Or for landowners, they're able to fund holding on to that land instead of selling it off for development or, or some other monetary resources. So it's a broadening of our business model and the forest conservation directors need to be somebody with a background in forestry, certainly in the wildlife aspects of forestry, and a broad understanding of timber markets, global markets, where things are going with carbon markets and carbon offsets, because that's driving, um, all of this drives our ability to do this habitat work. If there are no forest markets, and we saw this uh, broadly with the tariffs with China recently, it completely crashed our timber export mar markets. Sawmills went out of business. People who work in the woods had to fold up and the habitat wasn't being created. So and we need to broaden out and think more broadly about markets and how to be engaged in that business model. What you're talking about is a very entrepreneurial approach to conservation, and uh, and we've seen it on both ends. I, I live in Oregon where the spotted owl is, uh, is the devil incarnate. So we've seen that end of this whole economy as well. But so, so are we going to be seeing, um, seeing the Rough Grouse Society and the American Woodcock Society actually doing some sort of timber marketing per se on behalf of other landowners or what exactly, how's that going to play out? Yeah, that's the question we've been getting a lot is exactly how is it going to work? So what I just described to you is what I'm thinking of as the business model that we're going to start finding ways to approach this idea of working for us where you're using res revenue generated from timber sales to invest back into conservation. So that's the business model. The specific business plans are going to vary widely. Mm -hmm. we're, our approach, we always have been, we're not a large organization, is we need to be adaptable and nimble. And a private lands program in Wisconsin will be very different than a private lands program in uh, New Hampshire, which will be different than a public lands program in Western North Carolina. We've got to be adaptable on the specifics. Certain states have different tax codes related to forest management. So, you know, in Michigan, we've got to be aware of that. So all those details will start to play out. But when you have this forest conservation director overseeing their region, 
This needs to be an individual who understands the scope of all that and can help you build those individual business plans. That's the fundamental shift for us. So the biggest question your members have been asking me is, uh, what about the biology? How are you going to do that? Yeah, well, that's a great question. And um, the Rough Grouse Society, you know, the rock that we've stood on, a tenant for us is using sound science to guide decisions. So sound science and forest management and wildlife management. And we always look to the science. We look to the biology and to the research. But the Rough Grouse Society biologists per se haven't done that research. We get that research through our partners at universities, especially the land grant universities, the Forest Service research stations, state wildlife agency researchers. We coordinate with them and they are the ones day in and day out doing the research. We'll continue to fund that work, support that work, make sure we're reading the manuscripts, taking positions on graduate committees where asked. All of those things are, are the work of all of our staff. I have a deep science background myself. Our conservation and policy director, Brent Rudolph, has a doctorate in wildlife management. And of course, these forest conservation directors uh, in large part are going to have advanced degrees in forest and wildlife science too. So we're still gonna be well ingrained in the biology and the research end, not just for rough grouse, but the biology and research that we're learning about forests and how our forests are changing, how to make them resilient. We're still going to be keyed into all that. It's still going to be our central tenant, that science base. So um, you, you've been quoted as saying uh, we did uh, 700,000 acres of work over the past decade. We should be shooting for 700,000 acres a year not right. a decade obviously you think this is the route to take for that and why why the exponential uh at least raising of the bar at this point uh rough grouse and uh we do of course always want to give a nod to our, our quirky little friends that are flying around the country up and down right now the american woodcock and of course, Rough Grouse Society and American Woodcock Society, our partner organization formed in 2014. Uh, rough grouse are listed in 18 state wildlife action plans as a species of greatest conservation need. They're proposed for state endangered listing in Indiana. Uh, the state of Ohio recently shortened seasons and bag limits. The state of New Jersey recently closed their grouse seasons entirely. Declines are being shown across the board, and they're listed in 18 state wildlife action plans. That's a big deal. American Woodcock listed in 28 state wildlife action plans. The same kind of long-term declines are being seen. Where we're at right now is we're at the final point of ensuring that we can conserve not just rough grouse, but a lot of forest wildlife that are in the same condition. The trajectory in Indiana that graph is the same across much of grouse range. And once you get into a state endangered listing, you're approaching the point of no return. So where we're at now is we need to be able to increase our work exponentially across large landscapes uh, because we don't have much time left to get this habitat work done. That's Ben Jones. He's the CEO of the Rough Grouse Society and the American Woodcock Society. I'm Scott Linden. You're listening to a special edition of the Upland Nation podcast. Ben, just for, for the few of us out there who uh, can't quite grok the idea of, uh, uh, of habitat conservation, including cutting down trees, in, in 25 words or less, tell us uh, how forest management is different than uh, prairie and, and, and uh, pheasant management? Yeah, the key in forest management is sustainable management over time and having diverse age classes. When I say age classes, if you harvest a forest, you do a timber sale, uh, that creates a young forest stage. It's dynamic. That forest grows. You're cutting new forests, so you have this whole rotation. On a longer scale, but the same kind of thing you think of with burning your prairies. Mm -hmm. You let that prairie go for five years between fires and then you restart it over to sustainably manage it. Same thing, although a longer scale in forests. And of course, the, the species that we're trying to support here and conserve, if you will, um, need that 
change, if if we can call it change. Well, we like to call it diversity, yeah. and it's many many different age classes. And absolutely, whether it's rough grouse, whether it's white-tailed deer, or golden-winged warblers, or cerulean warblers, or Appalachian cottontails, snowshoe hare, all of them need that diversity. And thank you. I just learned how to pronounce cerulean. Uh, <laughs> really, yes. um, uh, I'm married to a jeweler. I, I know that word. <laughs> uh, um, so, so if, if I, I, I guess I am a member now that I think about it, uh, explain to me in, in its, in its fundamental form, how this is going to benefit me, this restructuring, how it's, how's it going to pay off for me as a member? Yes. Our members during the two years that I've been here are also asking for change. They want this organization to be more impactful. Uh, they want to be able to create more habitat. So for our members, they've been wanting this. They've been wanting reasons to go to their friends who aren't members and say, hey, join this organization. Look at this habitat work we're doing. Look at the scale we're improving hunting opportunity on. Uh, so our members have been asking for those kinds of things. And I think that's the benefit to them. It's work that they can see, work that's making a difference, and it's work that they can use to recruit more to come with us. So, so um, Ben, at the local level, I talked with a, a couple members yesterday who were uh, quite, of course, as you can imagine, crestfallen that their banquet was being uh, canceled. Mm -hmm. and, and not just because it's a good time. I've been to a bunch of them. I know that. But also because it's their primary fundraising activity for the year. Um, those funds are then divvied up between uh, national, if you will, and the local chapter and local projects. Is that mm -hmm. model going to change? Several things with that model and what COVID-19 really showed and made us deal with in a real way is that if we have a model that all the funds are raised from these events, uh, some going to national, some staying locally for habitat, and then all of a sudden you don't have events, then you don't have any habitat money, then you haven't had your impact. And so this right here shows us how tenuous that model can be. Over the years, we've been showing declining interest in the banquets in large part anyway, uh, and declining funds that are raised through banquets. So in that, we need to think about different kinds of events, and our chapters are doing a great job of this, being creative, thinking new ways to get together, new ways to raise that money. And for me, where I would ultimately like to go is that every dollar that's raised at local events stays in that state for habitat. And we don't need to pull that into national because we've leveraged other funds through various other means um, to fund the organization as a whole. So to me, it is definitely a goal to get to the point where all the funds raised at a local event can stay in that state. Kind of a pheasants forever model, if I recall. Um, Indeed, yes. Uh, so, so how about your corporate partners? Speaking of fundraising, there are, you know, large donors out there who expect whatever they expect for their dollars. Hopefully it's great conservation work and maybe a little bit of exposure. How have they received this restructuring news? You know, I, I think our corporate sponsors are, they're going to see increased impact. And what our corporate sponsors really want, want to look at is, you know, what's the size of our membership and this relationship that we have with our corporate sponsors? And if we can grow our membership and grow um, that part of the, the relationship that we have with the corporate sponsor, then that's going to be something that they're really excited about. But just like our membership too, a corporate sponsor that's supporting us, they want to be able to say, look at this rough grouse society and the things that they're doing. That's our, we help support them. Look at the scope of the work they're doing. They're saving rough grouse. Uh, so I think that it, it goes all across the board. Have your friends at the highest levels and other conservation groups um, chimed in on this uh, restructuring yet? <laughs> no, I, but I can assure you they're, they're probably watching how this goes. And um, I, I would think for certain as hard a hit as many groups are taking that uh, I'm not going to be the only one uh, at some point forced to make layoffs. So I'm, though I haven't had an opportunity to talk with anyone and 
I'm sure they can appreciate how busy I've been through this all. I, I know they're watching how it goes. I'm sure. Uh, no doubt about that. That's for sure. Um, do you think that land owners who you work with on a cooperative basis are going to, uh, are, are going to receive this kind of new model in a different way than they used to? I mean, we're talking about going from in effect a, uh, uh, out of the goodness of our hearts, we're going to help you with this to, um, to a more uh, pragmatic approach. I'll give you one example, and this is really important to our members as we, if we think about public lands. So through stewardship agreements, we can actually do timber harvest work and oversee timber sales on national forest lands. And of course, this is a big deal for grouse hunters uh, who need those public lands and good places to hunt. But we can work with our Forest Service partners, hire foresters, and through a stewardship agreement, the revenue from that timber sale can stay entirely on that forest district. It can offset all of our costs of staffing the foresters, and any additional revenue beyond that will stay on that district for more habitat work for improved access for any of a number of things. So in addition to funding our initial investment of those people on the ground, it funds more habitat work. And for our partners like the Forest Service, it gives them much needed additional staff that's out there getting this work done. So I can tell you already that there's one example of the US Forest Service is very excited about us getting involved in this round. Oh, I can't imagine anybody looking at at anything but the upsides to this. Uh, you know, you've had, it looks like, and in the, in the latest numbers I have are, are almost ancient history now, but your, your 2018 financials may have been the biggest gap between income and expenses in, well, in recent memory. Um, do you anticipate a, a, a further downtrend before you start seeing things uh, start trending upward again? Well, we're clearly going to see a downtrend because of a complete uh, almost halt of the economy right, right now. Uh, but outside of that, Scott, what you're pointing out, it wasn't sustainable to maintain the status quo for yeah. much longer. I've been working for two years and thinking new ways to get this in motion. It was time to pull the pin and get it going because we we couldn't just maintain for much longer. So that revenue mm -hmm. needs to start coming in. And uh, I think we're going to be in a good place to do it. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast, special edition. That's Ben Jones, the CEO of the Rough Grouse Society and the American Woodcock Society. I'm Scott Linden, your, your host. And um, talking about this restructuring, which uh, I, I tend to agree, I don't want to editorialize, but I, th I, I think it's... Uh, it's going to be the way of the future in, in, in a lot of situations. But one of the things that I've, I've always wondered about with you folks in particular is, do you, did this come to you as almost a light bulb moment or when you were hired with a, back, a deep background, not only in biology, but in forestry, was this something that kind of was itching the whole time? It was a combination of seeing other models and past experiences. So for over a decade before I came to the Rough Grouse Society, I was overseeing management of uh, about a million and a half acres of state game lands in Pennsylvania, and 90-some percent of those lands were forested. So I was really well immersed in using commercial timber harvest and uh, to get this work done and how it funded the operations of our state wildlife agency. Here in Pennsylvania, we don't get any general tax funds to support the wildlife agency. Mm -hmm. So that forest revenue was very important to uh, supporting all the other programs in the wildlife agency. So I had over a decade kind of in this model and the ability to, to think about it in this respect. And then as I look at where some other organizations, and a great example right now is the Nature Conservancy, they've adopted this idea of working forests into the work that they do, where they're securing unprecedentedly huge properties, well over 100,000 acres in um, southeastern Kentucky, uh, northern Tennessee recently. And they're managing those lands sustainably for forest products the revenue of which is helping fund their management of that land 
and additional purchases in the future. So the Nature Conservancy has adopted this and they're doing very well. Another group, the Conservation Fund, same kind of model where they're realizing that revenue to, uh, to, to buy additional properties. And they're also investing in this way. And I saw this import, importance here in Pennsylvania with the state lands. It's very important to local economies. That, that local economy that has the paper mill or the sawmill, where those loggers live, where they're raising their families. This is really important for rural economies and something that resonates with our legislators, jobs. So uh, it's really a holistic approach. Well, I'll tell you, um, I'm excited for you and for the organization and um, if for maybe the entire conservation movement. Uh, this could be uh, the tip of the iceberg, and I wish you the best of luck. Ben Jones, the chief executive at the Rough Grouse Society and the American Woodcock Society. I'm Scott Linden. You're listening to the Upland Nation podcast. Uh, ben, if you, if, if you, you will be, I'm sure, explaining in great detail over the next few weeks to any number of people uh, exactly what you want to accomplish. If, if we have missed anything here, what would you think would be the most important thing you'd want to bring up? Um, wow, that's a great question. I, I, I guess there are some things that I would want to reiterate and that this move uh, isn't us abandoning biology and we're not just hiring, you know, uh, some some bunch of industry wonks to run the, you know, the biology or that's, that's not how, that's not how this is working. We are thoughtfully working through how to work, uh, how to incorporate um, forest products into more conservation work. And the types of uh, forest conservation directors we're looking for are going to have to be people who are steeped in the economics, but also well-versed in the biology and the sustainability piece too. So I've seen that comment kind of suggesting that we were just leaving behind the biology. Nothing could be further from the truth. And what we need to make sure that we're doing right now is implementing what the science has shown us over the past 60 years, that habitat is needed at a very large scale. Uh, that's actionable intel. And if we don't learn one additional thing from research, we've got our work cut out from the research that's already been done, showing us how much habitat we need to impact. So I think I'd just like to reiterate that more than ever, we're firmly based in science and sustainability, and uh, there's a lot of work to do. Well, that's probably a good place to cap it off right there. I know you've got a lot on your plate right now, including more of this kind of discussion coming up. So, uh, Ben, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks so much for joining us here on the Upland Nation podcast. And, uh, Maybe the understatement of the day, but good luck. Scott, I, I appreciate the opportunity. It's through uh, avenues like this. We're going to keep getting the word out, and uh, I appreciate it. You're welcome, and good night. But not for you all, you listeners. Just please make a mental note of all the other folks who made this special edition of the Upland Nation possible. Dr. Tim's Performance Dog Food. Learn more about them at drtims.com. ESPamerica.com is where you learn about electronic shooters protection. And Cabela's.com, you know all about what they do for me and for you. They've got some great stuff out there. Gunner Kennels at Gunner.com. Learn about the only five-star crash-tested kennel per the Center, of Pet, Center for Pet Safety Standards. We'll cover everything else that you love to hear from the Upland Nation podcast coming up on Thursday. But until then, thank you for listening. If you're a Rough Grouse Society or American Woodcock Society member, please tell your friends to listen in, share it, rate it, review it, spread the word. Remember, we will be hunting this fall. Keep the faith. I'm Scott Linden. Thanks for listening.